Good afternoon, Cincinnati. Did I see you folks here? Did I see you in San Francisco two years ago? Do we have a movement? 1,400 people. 1,400 people. With no, with, let's be clear, with no mandate, with no particular money, have found a way to come to the Queen City of Cincinnati, to join together for three days to honor their moral compass that has brought them to this notion of full service community schools. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Villarreal. I'm the chair of the coalition, proudly, uh, coalition steering committee. In my day job, I work at the San Francisco Foundation as a program officer for education, where we have over a dozen districts in the San Francisco Bay Area that are planning their full service community schools. <laughs> San Francisco Bay Area. That. And today is really a dream come true for me. Like many of you, I've been at this for over 20 years, starting first as a teacher and counselor, a crisis counselor at a high school, realizing that I was losing kids every single day, dropping out, moving on, domestic violence, suicide, issues of hunger and poverty, not being able to figure out what we were going to do how we were going to help them. We had agency partners across town. We had people that gave us their numbers for referrals, but we weren't making it happen. The last year that I left Jefferson High School in Daly City, I went to six funerals. Six. Three were current students, and three were former students. And we realized we had to do something different. We had to build on the historical sense of school as a center of community to bring partners together. And here we are today in an amazing way to celebrate, to learn, and to grow together. I'd like to start out by acknowledging a number of leaders in the room. First of all, starting with the Cincinnati public school leadership, especially Superintendent Mary Ronan. School Board President Eve Bolton, and Union President Julie Sellers. I'd also like to acknowledge the Community Learning Center Institute, especially Darlene Kamine, and Annie Bogenschutz. I'd also like to acknowledge the many funders in the room and if you can keep a secret, I'll tell you that we have about 50 funders that have been invited, and they're not on anybody's list, and we're going to be having some special meetings because there was so much interest in the community schools movement that they found a way to come to Cincinnati. So they'll be in and out of sessions, and we'll be having some great meetings with them this afternoon and tomorrow. So I'd like to acknowledge, sort of anonymously acknowledge and um, thank the funders who have come. We have a number of city leaders that you're going to be meeting in a few minutes, a number of educators and parents, people here in the role as parent, in the role of educator. We have our national planning committee that I would like to acknowledge, and of course, our wonderful volunteers and our host committee. And last but not least, for this round of thank yous, I'd like to send a strong shout out to all of the staff of the Coalition for Community Schools and our leader, the director, Marty Blank. <laughs> so we have a very diverse group of people here. Um, we're expecting close to 1,600 by the time that Friday is over. They're coming from 38 states, from five different countries, 114 from California. 105 from New York, 77 from Wisconsin, 68 from New Mexico, 62 from Indiana, 
55 from Tennessee. And we had dozens of people taking buses from Milwaukee, from Chicago, from Pittsburgh, and from many, many other cities. So far, we have had close to 400 people visiting one of 17 community learning centers. And can we thank our local schools, our coordinators, and our partners for sharing their knowledge with us? I'd also like to recognize and welcome the participants from this year's first ever Family and Community Engagement Conference, also sponsored by IEL. How many of you are from that conference too? Yes. The collaboration of these two conferences demonstrates the bridges and important connections between community schools and family and community engagement. So I'd like to take just a moment to share with you some thoughts about the state of the field. And I think we have, yeah, we have our PowerPoint here. So the, just a second. You know that this movement has grown over many years to address a variety of need that uh, is creating the kinds of disparities in classrooms and in schools that are creating substantial barriers uh, to learning. And so we talk about addressing the conditions for learning, and these are some of the conditions that we're talking about. And I'd like to invite you to take a look at um, the uh, Kids Count data source online to look up your own county and to look up some of your own stats so that you can make compelling cases for your own school boards and other groups of leaders. And the system of community schools, the systems of community schools, the sort of big family tree of community schools across the United States goes by a lot of different names in a lot of different places. And you're going to be hearing from some of them in the workshops and in the mini plenary sessions. But what's amazing is in less than a decade, we have had a 300% growth in the number of schools and districts that are claiming this big banner and this big umbrella of community schools. Yeah, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. When we talk about our impact, let me give you some examples. And this, is, this isn't, of, of course, this isn't all of our impact, but some examples from different places across the United States. In Palm Beach County, Florida, nearly 80% of students who participated in an early learning program before kindergarten were rated fully ready on a state school readiness assessment as compared to those who didn't. In the area of keeping students in school, an evaluation of the Elevate community schools revealed that eighth grade students who consistently attended an Elevate out of school activity were significantly more likely to also participate in high school planning activities, high school tours, test preparation, mock interviews, etc. In the area of academic achievement, here in Cincinnati, Ohio, students in community learning centers saw, on average, a five to six point increase in their reading scores over two years from 2009 to 2011, and a five point advance in math scores. Cincinnati was also the first urban school district in Ohio to receive an effective rating and is the highest rated urban school district in the state. That's a lot to be proud of. In cost-effectiveness, a social return on investment study done by the Children's Aid Society Community Schools in New York City found that every dollar spent on community schools returns between $10 and $15 of social value. And in terms of increased graduation rates among the 90 communities in schools and, uh, and 90 matched non-communities in schools, high schools, with complete data on graduation, Rates among high implementers increased by close to 9% across three years. Now, not only do we have some boasting rights about some of these outcomes, but we have some very, very significant networks uh, for capacity building. And you can see on the right-hand side of this page the Coalition for Community Schools Networks 
uh, that we are featuring, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but the ones that we decided to capture on this slide. On the left-hand side, you see some of the external networks that are region-specific from across the United States, and I'm sure that if we took a poll across the room, we would see that many, many more are represented by you and your colleagues from home. In the area of policies, some big policy wins for community schools in recent days. There's been a $50 million investment at the federal level since 2008 in growing community schools, not including the $10 million appropriated for the 2014 grantees. We have a growing state momentum with $16 million invested by New York State and Washington, D.C. Strong advocacy efforts in states such as Illinois, New Mexico, and Connecticut. And this is a sign in the increased interest and focus of our work at the state and national level. And I would add to that, as we're watching Common Core roll out, we're seeing some significant elements of community schools' approaches and community school strategies bubble up in the Common Core implementation as well. And not, last but not least, when we look to Community Schools 2020, we see that we have grown a great deal in the last 20 years, and we ask ourselves, how are we going to continue to grow and get traction nationally in ways that we really deserve around policy, around mandates, and around money? We need the wisdom, we need the perspective, and we need the collective vision of you in the field to help us move the movement forward. And here are three ways right away that you can help. You can start by texting yes to the number provided. You can find Bill Patapchuk at the State Networking Breakfast for a group conversation on strategic planning, and we need your input on this national strategic planning. And last but not least, you can fill out a five to 10 minute online survey at the Action Center right outside. All in all, we're asking you to help us create an even stronger and more concrete vision for community schools as we strengthen our commitment to support our children, youth, and their families. So now, I have the extreme pleasure of introducing a very, very important person for the city, for the state, and for the nation, Mayor John Cranley. And I'm going to, uh, go ahead, come on. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about him. Um, <laughs> well, this is important, though. This is good stuff. Um, so John, you may or may not know, was raised in Price Hill. He was infused with a deep faith and commitment to giving back at a young age. And he and his wife, Dina, are raising their son, Joseph, here in the city, committed to the same ideals of hard work, service, and faith. John is dedicated to moving Cincinnati forward so it becomes a center of opportunity and innovation. Here's some examples. While he was on the city council, he led a bipartisan coalition that balanced the budget for eight straight years. He put more cops on the street, prioritized basic services, and he also put in place the tax increment finance districts that have made the revitalization of places like the banks, Fountain Square, Gateway Quarter, and Washington Park possible. In the private sector, Cranley developed the Incline District Project in East Price Hill during the worst economy for real estate in 70 years. As a lawyer at a prominent firm, he acted as legal counsel to deals such as the Vernon Manor Conversion for Children's Hospital and the CityLink Social Service Center Project in the West End, which is a faith-based comprehensive anti-poverty program sponsored largely by Crossroads Church. Cranley's commitment to civil rights and equal opportunity match the values of the Queen City. John led the effort to ban racial profiling and was a lead negotiator for the historic collaborative agreement, which has done so much to improve race relations in the city. John also led the effort to pass the hate crimes law after the murder of a person for their sexual orientation. As the co-founder and former director of the Ohio Innocent Project, which has exonerated 16 people through DNA testing, and you know we're going to talk about the pipeline to prison and the connections there in a later workshop. But this Ohio Innocent Project exonerated 16 people through DNA testing. Cranley built an organization by raising the necessary funds, hiring the right people, and working hard to bring justice to people who were wrongly imprisoned. 
John graduated from St. Williams, St. Xavier High School, and then went on to earn degrees from John Carroll University, Harvard Law School, Harvard Divinity School, and he serves on the boards of Free Store Food Bank, Mercy Hospital Foundation, and the Jesuit Spiritual Center. And I must say, these are some of the most stunning credentials we could ever hope to have to launch our Community Schools Conference. Please welcome with me, Mayor John Cranley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very uh, nice description of my background. I, I think I wrote it, actually. Um, it came right off my website. So uh, it's all true, but uh, it really is a result of being the son of an educator. My mom uh, is a lifelong uh, librarian and educator in public schools here in Cincinnati. Thank you. Give her applause. <clears throat> And it's great that, first of all, I want to welcome you all to the Queen City, and we hope you spend a lot of money. We hope you have a lot of fun and advance the great cause. <clears throat> and it is amazing to see the diversity of, of names that were mentioned in all the different states and uh, regions from around the country that are here. We're so glad to have you for such a noble endeavor. And I do want to point out uh, a few of the leaders here that in Cincinnati have made this all possible. Uh, Mary Ronan was already mentioned, Eve Bolton is on a school board. Darlene Kamine, who's been working on this for, for 10 years, or longer, really. Um, and also, it's great that you have uh, Professor Chris Edley, who's going to be speaking to you, uh, I think, later, uh, who was my educator at, uh, at, at law school. And uh, I'm still promoting education, and I uh, hope you still get my marks, maybe get a higher grade than I got from him uh, in law school. And let me just take a second to brag, and not a, a typical bragging, because I really can't take credit for this. Um, in Cincinnati, our school system is separately elected uh, than the mayor and the council. So candidly, while I'm extremely proud of our amazingly and frankly innovative and ahead of the curve investment in community learning centers, uh, it really wasn't my work. It was the work of Darlene and the school boards over many, many years. In fact, uh, some of you may remember Governor John Gilligan uh, who recently died, who was governor in the 70s, came back into public service in his 80s and led the effort to pass a levy to really make our investment here locally in community learning centers a possibility. Uh, he was joined by many, many people, including David Crowley, who's also uh, passed, unfortunately. But the fact is that this community has embraced community learning centers, it has embraced the investments necessary, and that work has been carried through through several superintendents and followed through by Mary Ronan. Now, the one thing I will brag about is that my mother in addition to being a teacher, did serve on the uh, school board as an elected official for four years and was able to help uh, shepherd a lot of this through. So I take derivative credit, but not personal credit uh, for that uh, continued investment. But let me just break it down. There's a selfish and then there's the moral approach. As international competition becomes more important <clears throat> and school years are candidly longer elsewhere in the world than they are in this country, the Community Learning Center model gives us a way as Americans to compete better on a global basis and having a better educated workforce and brighter opportunities for all Americans. But let's be real, we're in a city, we're in an urban core. In our region, about 80% of the poverty rate under federal guidelines lives in, in my city. The Community Learning Centers are a lifeblood for us for opportunity to improve access, to provide additional resources that are desperately needed. And the positive outcomes speak for themselves in terms of the opportunities for individuals and in pursuing a, fu a future uh, uh, life opportunities. But the social impact that it has on our community and our city is tremendous. And candidly, we wouldn't have as, as safe or a quality neighborhoods and cities if we hadn't made these investments. So these are the kinds of investments that really build communities in more ways than one. And I'm so glad that all of you are here. And I'm so glad that our city, not because of my work, but by the work of so many others here, have really put Cincinnati on the map in support of community learning centers. So please spend your money, have a great time, learn from each other, and take this great uh, mission across the country. Thank you very much.
So now we have another big treat for you. As we embrace the theme of equity and as we experience this fierce urgency to address so many of the disparities that our youth are experiencing in, in their schools and in their school communities, we came across an amazing little video produced by students in Oakland um, and the co yes. Uh, the coalition saw the video, which was created for their school district to talk about their community schools, and we felt like it had implications for national viewing. And so we asked them to develop a second edition of it for the national uh, viewing, and you're going to see it in just a minute. But before you see it, I'd like to introduce and, and have come up three very, very important people um, who created this video. I'd like to call up Damari Lawrence, who is a graduate of Skyline High School, Oakland, and currently attends Laney Community College. Come on up, Damari. Nancy Tafoya, Nancy Tafoya from Envision Academy in Oakland and plans to attend Laney College in the fall. And their teacher, Jake Shoniker from the Media Enterprise Alliance at KDOL Television, a group that partners with Oakland Unified School District's Office of Communications to work with you, help them build sets and do great videos. And they're gonna tell you about the video and then we're gonna see it. Take it away. You wanna go first? Sure, um, just to just start off, I'm gonna hand it over to these guys uh, real quick, they can tell you about the video. Um, but we are from Oakland, um, a amazing school district that is implementing community schools all across the district. Uh, and we are proud, um, I work for KDOL TV, actually the Media Enterprise Alliance at KDOL TV, and we are proud to be in a community school watching it work um, every day. So we, we have a child development center, an elementary school, a high school, a health center, a college counseling, all available for these guys and for all the students at, um, at that school. It's just amazing to see. Um, we provide media training for high school students all across Oakland. Um, we train them in camera work, editing, all the way up to animation, graph design, and professional skills. So um, I've seen Nancy and Damari grow up from uh, being sophomores in our program to now being graduates, um, getting paid work in media, and being able to create some amazing amazing stuff um, all across the city. And last summer, um, the Oakland Unified School District approached us and they wanted to create a video that really, um, really emphasized the vision of community schools in Oakland um, and what it meant for students. And so we were approached by them and it was a perfect opportunity for our students to get some paid um, summer internship experience creating this animation. Um, and they did an amazing job, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but I want to let, let these guys talk, tell you all about it. Yeah. I'm Nancy. I'm a recent graduate from Vision Academy. I'm also an intern at Media Enterprise Alliance. Um, we came into this internship knowing nothing about animation. And we started from scratch. And in six weeks, we produced the ODSD version. And we learned time management and how to work as a team, because everybody could work in separate parts. And we had to make it all fit. And now Damari will tell you the concept. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Damari. I go by DJ. And um, the concept of the community schools piece is um, supposed to be a place that's an epicenter of academic and mental support for all students to get the proper amount of education they need to you know, get to point A to B in their, in their education, in their life. Uh, we, want, we want students to be able to, what am I saying students? I'm, I'm 19 years old. I had recently graduated from Skyline <laughs> High School in Oakland. Um, thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I'm about to go back to school for, for theater arts and learning how to set up stages and everything, all from the stuff that I've learned through Media Enterprise Alliance and KDOL, anyway, to get back to the community schools piece. Um, yeah, what we do, the work that we do is exemplary of, the, of what we want to try to get every school in the United States, and possibly the world too, to get students to learn about um, what we call the super school, which is it's, it's basically a nexus of everything that a child needs in order to, you know, I don't want to be repetitive, but to get to point A to B, because there's a lot of challenges out there for students. Um, yeah, so we hope you all will help us and 
lighting kids is fire, wonder, and light, you know, for the brain, for us to flourish. I hope you enjoy the video. And uh, just as a last thing, I want to really thank the coalition for bringing this out. This is a tremendous opportunity for these young folks to come out, see another part of the country, speak in front of all you guys like they are right now, and just have this tremendous opportunity. I'm really proud of the work they're doing, and it's so great to be able to see them and see their work on the big screen. So thank you so much. children are filled with light, fire, and wonder. Every child needs nurturing and care for their light to shine, their fire to burn, and their sense of wonder to expand. But right now, our country remains divided by predictable patterns, high rates of violence, and a lack of connection. And in the middle of it all, our students are falling through the cracks. Too often, kids come to school in a state that interferes with learning, carrying the baggage of fear, hunger, physical pain, and psychological distress. They don't have opportunities to play and learn after school and in the summer, and college seems like a faraway dream. It's only by coming together as a community that we can create thriving students who will climb to meet their full potential. That's going to take work. It's going to take a change in mindset. We must break the system built on division and build in its place a new model that connects individuals, families, neighborhoods, schools, and other institutions together with the understanding that our fates are linked. This country can only reach its potential if we help our children develop the skills required for success in school, career, and life. The goal is thriving students. The vision is community schools. Community schools are welcoming, fun, and attractive spaces for students and families to use before, during, and after the school day. In this approach, the school acts as the hub of the community, working with public and private partners to serve children, their families, and their neighborhood. Youth development opportunities, health, and social services are not seen as extra or complementary. They are integrated into the fabric of the school as an essential part of its DNA. Every community school responds to local needs, but all community schools provide a safe, healthy, and supportive environment for students. Collaborate with community partners to enhance learning and create enriching opportunities for students. Develop the knowledge and skills needed for students to succeed in college, career, and life. More and more schools and communities across the country are working toward the day when every school is a community school, providing every child with high quality instruction with a focus on college and career, expanded learning opportunities beyond the school day, health, nutrition, and physical education, and strong family and community engagement. That includes access to crucial family support systems, such as housing, language learning, and employment. The road is long and the work is hard, but it's the most important work there is. Please join us as we work to create a nation full of community schools and thriving students. Let's hear it for them. So how many of you have kids at home or kids that you've raised or like a 15-year-old daughter? <laughs> Mine's 30 now, so I can smirk. <laughs> one, of the, one of the thousand things that's so powerful about this video is nobody wrote their script. They figured it out. It's because it was their lived experience. They got guidance along the way, but you know that you're telling the truth when a young person, when a young adult hears it and plays it back to you in a way that you can recognize. We have no greater compass, no greater reality check 
no greater moral rubric to answer to than young people, like these three young people right here. Thank you so much. We're so proud of you. So, obviously, this is all about equity. And it became really clear to us in the coalition over this last year, over these last couple of years, that we also need in this country sort of a nouveau equity movement to go along with our statements around community schools. I mean, we spent some time thinking that it was embedded that people should know and understand. And as we went around the nation, we realized, no, people don't know. People don't understand. And that more than 50 years past Brown versus the Board of Education, more than 50 years past the Civil Rights Movement, the early Civil Rights Movement, and more than 50 years after the War on Poverty, the nation, with some of the greatest education disparities, health disparities, employment disparities, income disparities that we've ever seen clearly does not get it about equity. Because it's not equality. And we decided to set out on a journey of drafting an equity statement, a starter equity statement, to be followed on by action steps. And so when you came in and you sat down on the paper, and you sat down on this about half an hour ago. This is our first official draft. And what we want from you is we want to know, did we get it right? You know, this is very, very hard work to do, especially when you're working in an environment where you want to be nonpartisan, when you're working in an environment that has seen 20 years of a roller coaster ride in terms of even being willing to use the word equity or race, and an environment that's rebuilding the kinds of things that we didn't get right in the 60s and 70s and building them in a new and improved way. So here's what we'd like for you to do. We'd like for you to take a look at this and we would like for you to provide feedback to us and share your ideas for action steps all along the way. And the, the address that we'd like you to use, oh, is, is it up there? Yeah, yeah, oh, good. I don't have to read it out loud. Equity.communityschools at IEL.org. <clears throat> So it really is only fitting and proper that we bring up now to help launch our equity movement within uh, the community schools movement, a very, very important thought leader um, in the 21st century, 21st century equity movement. Um, Christopher Edley Jr. was dean at the UC Berkeley School of Law from 04 to 2013 after 23 years as a Harvard Law professor. His academic work is in administrative law, civil rights, education policy, and domestic public policy. Professor Edley has moved between academia and public service, giving him broad familiarity with many areas of public policy. He served in the White House policy and budget positions under Presidents Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton. Edley held senior positions in five presidential campaigns, including senior policy advisor for Barack Obama. And he then served on Obama's transition board with responsibility for education, immigration, and health. More recently, Edley co-chaired the congressionally chartered National Commission on Education Equity and Excellence, which became our Bible as we began to write this paper. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Public Administration, the Council of Foreign Relations, and Gates Foundation's National Programs Advisory Panel, and he continues on as a Berkeley professor. Beyond that, I have to say that I am extremely proud to have Chris Edley at UC Berkeley and representing the Bay Area the East Bay, he wants me to stop <laughs> and to call him my mentor and friend. <laughs> Folks, Chris, thank you.
Thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, I have to say it's, it's quite an honor to have been asked to address this crowd. Uh, you, you folks are the bee's knees. Uh, what you're doing is so important, and I think the progress that you've made uh, is, is so inspiring. Uh, the only problem is that I think the rest of us are going to be increasingly dependent upon your energies, your vision, uh, your strength. Uh, so it's imperative that you keep on keeping on uh, and that you broaden your shoulders because there's so much work to be done and you are definitely at the vanguard. Uh, I want to say before starting that also that uh, Mayor Cranley, uh, just for the record, uh, got a higher grade from me in administrative law uh, than Barack Obama did. <laughs> uh, so those of you who are here from Cincinnati, I want to congratulate you on your good judgment. And let's see what the rest of the state has to say. Uh, Okay, how do I, oh, thank you. All right, now I have to apologize in advance. This is gonna be a fairly wonky presentation because that was my, uh, that was my charge and that's who I am. So the core of what I'm gonna talk about is uh, the content of the report on the National Commission on Education, Equity, and Excellence. Uh, because we believe that we formulated, that that commission formulated a fairly comprehensive set of policy principles uh, to guide all of us as we struggle forward over the next several years uh, to produce excellence and equity. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the conceptual issues of equity and excellence. I'm going to try to describe in uh, sort of a teaser fashion, some of the content of our recommendations. Uh, I'm gonna tell you what our current thinking is about how to follow up on the recommendations, and in particular, the role that the coalition might be able to play uh, in all of that. Uh, so, the commission itself. Congress created this statute, uh, I guess it was 2011? Yeah, 2011, the fall of 2011, the fall of 2010. The commission was established in the winter of 2011, appointed by the Secretary of Education. None of us, I think, really wanted to be on a commission uh, because uh, this is a group of quite experienced people who've been on many commissions and know that they are almost always a profound waste of time. Uh, but you know how sometimes you don't really feel like you're going to a party, but you know there are gonna be great people there, so you drag yourself to the party anyway? That's sort of what happened here. Uh, and the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, bless his heart, basically lied to each of us about who had already agreed to be on the commission. And so we showed up for the first day and looked around the table and everybody said to themselves, God, I can't believe they talked her into doing this. I can't believe they talked. We worked for two years, it's supposed to be one year. We had virtually no staff, which means that when we produced a report, oh, and I should add, there were a bunch of lawyers on this commission, which is never a good idea because every sentence in our 55-page report had to be negotiated. <laughs> and it's not as though these are really easy issues, right? Did I, did I kill that? No. It's not as though these are easy issues that we were dealing with. And I'm very pleased to say that with the very diverse membership uh, there, we were unanimous in our recommendations, and the recommendations are federal, state, and local. Uh, therefore, what communities could do, as well as what Congress can do, and everybody in between. But there's one central idea. And the way I would frame it is that 
we're going to get where we want to go only by ensuring that each and every child has an instructional strategy that is effective for that child. And that means that the school itself, the community around it, the district, the state, have to have policies and resources in place to make available what's necessary for each and every child to get what they need in order to succeed. I think you can already anticipate the important role that community schools have in making that a reality. Now, you notice that in the overarching framework, we don't use the word equity. And this was a hard, we discussed this a lot. We discussed this a lot. And what we decided is that for general consumption, the key principle is excellence for each and every child. And that if you can, in fact, provide excellence for each and every child, I'm sorry, if you can provide excellence for each and every child, the equity issues in the sense of disparities, we can take care of that along the way. That's gonna happen along the way because obviously these disparities are the result of not providing each and every child with the supports that they need, with the opportunities that they need. But moreover, our sense is that as a part of our clarion call, we emphasize that excellence and equity are inseparable. You can't have one without the other, not in the kind of America we're interested in, and certainly not for an America that's going to be competitive internationally, or that will have the social cohesion or the moral character we all believe is crucial. The recommendations within this theme of each and every child fall into five policy baskets, and I'll say a little bit about each one of these. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize that this unanimity uh, reached by the commission for federal, state, and local steps to be taken was not at the level of platitudes, but it wasn't at the level of the policy plumbing either. It's sort of, as a, it's sort of a middle level of policy principles that have to be tailored to the particular circumstances of states and districts and, uh, and schools, but still around that principle of each and every child. Uh, and of course, we were driven to this by the observation empirically of how deeply difficult these challenges are, how pervasive they are. The illusion that so many, America, so many Americans have about the excellence of what their children, what our children are receiving, bursting that bubble is a tough thing to do. It's a very tough thing to do because, look, I'm a parent. And if I step back from that role and I look at the performance of the Berkeley Public Schools, I know that they're not way up there. I worship the teachers and the administrators at my kids' school. I think they're just fabulous. I know they're trying hard. I know that they're trying to do all the right things. But the school, I know the school isn't there where it needs to be. But I can't, in the morning, tell myself that I'm sending my kids off to a mediocre middle school. That's too much cognitive dissonance. I have to believe that I'm sending my kids off to have a good experience, a positive experience. And of course, all of America feels that way. And we need to lift our expectations as, as for what we expect from our nation and what we expect from ourselves. So, first basket.
of course we made the ritual observation that there need to be more resources. But frankly, I think the more important contribution of uh, the commission's work is to focus on two things. One is the need to, in many, many states, think through more carefully what it would actually cost to deliver the kinds of opportunities we know are necessary in order to deliver excellence for each and every child. And to then compare the funding that they provide to their schools and how those funds are distributed across districts and even across schools within districts to see whether or not we're following the evidence in an effort to provide excellence for each and every child. So there's an analytical task and a political task that go together there, and courts, litigation, can only get us so far. So mobilizing those arguments, delivering that analysis, creating strong expectations in the community that we will have funds flowing to those who need it most, is fundamental to progress in this basket. The second thing we talk about is efficiency. It's not just about the adequacy of the funds, but it's about the efficiency with which they're spent. And here I'm not talking about do you waste paper clips. The most important aspect of efficiency, and if I could wave a wand, the single most important thing that I would do about school financing generally is to stop spending money on things that don't work to stop spending money on things that don't work. I don't gainsay the difficulty of overcoming the inertia to keep spending money the same way. But that's an equity issue if you just keep spending it the same way. And it's an excellence issue if you just keep spending it the same way. We're already a little bit behind the curve because as communities recovered from the recession, and revenues began to flow in, and education budgets uh, began to be restored, the impulse in almost every jurisdiction was to just restore cuts that had been made rather than to think about whether, as a matter of strategy, there were more effective ways to spend the dollars that were being put back into education. Okay, so some possible solutions. I've sort of basically said this. Uh, this, is, this is important. Uh, information systems, data. I, I've been giving speeches for 20 years now about how data, good data, is a civil rights issue. Right? You can't measure discipline disparities, attainment disparities, the distribution of effective teachers unless you have data. And people who want to suppress data or don't want to invest in getting data, whether they admit it or not, the effect of that is to hide problems so that we can't attack them. Now, there's that old saying that if you're not, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. Well, I sort of feel like if you're against collecting the data, then you're part of the problem. And uh, I know it's a very wonky issue, but uh, uh, in some ways it's a predicate for political action and for policy change. Uh, the second major basket, of course, is teaching and learning. We know that teachers and principals are the single most important in-school factor in student success. The support that we have to provide teachers in the way in which they're trained, in the kind of professional development that they get, in the ancillary resources that they can bring to bear to see that each and every child gets what they need. Those are central, those are central to providing the excellence for all that we're talking about. And note that it implies, it implies a different strategy, an improved strategy, a more intensive strategy for preparing the profession. So if you put yourself in the, in the shoes of my daughter's seventh grade science teacher, 
if he is going to figure out why my daughter is having trouble, it requires a training that permits him to do the right diagnosis. It requires that he have available to him an idea about a portfolio of different instructional strategies, that he have access to the technology, to the specialists, to a team that can help deliver what my daughter needs in order to be successful. Uh, I think about the nurse practitioner model in medicine as compared with the nursing model. We can't retrain every teacher in America overnight, but we could start to think about the pipeline, a pipeline that produces teachers who are prepared for and who are given broader professional responsibilities and get the compensation that goes along with that. Now, okay, I think the rest of that is pretty self-evident, however difficult it may be. Third basket, early childhood education. All I want to say here is, because I know everybody agrees by now that's important. What we have emphasized is that the research tells us that if you do early childhood education the right way, and it has to include A, B, C, D, E, and F, then you can narrow the gap between poor kids and middle class kids upon arrival in kindergarten. You can narrow the gap in readiness to learn by as much as 35, even 40%. And it's sustainable. Now, if you know anything about education research, you know that we never see effect sizes that big for any kind of intervention in education. If you think about that as mitigating 30% of the impact of poverty on readiness to learn in kindergarten, that's a huge, huge hit. The challenge is that you only get that huge hit if you do it the right way, A, B, C, D, and E. And I'm sorry to say that 90% of Head Start programs don't fit that prescription. Don't fit that prescription. So it's, moreover, 65% of poor kids showing up for kindergarten already get some kind of preschool education. So whatever it is they're getting, it's not enough. It's not the right kind, and it's not enough. So as we push forward, here's the challenge for all of us. As we see our cities, our states, the federal government move forward on early childhood education, if we really want to get the bang for our buck, for the kids who need it most, we have to do it the way the research tells us will have the greatest impact on kids. And whether you're a parent, a Head Start provider, or a political hack, this is one of those circumstances in which there is a direct link between program quality and character on the one hand and outcomes for poor kids on the other. Fourth basket. Well, I've already indicated that early childhood is a major part of the thing, of the, among the things that we can do to try to mitigate the impact of poverty. Here in a nation where we have more child poverty than any of our OECD competitors, we're simply not gonna be able to deliver on excellence for each and every kid unless we do several things to try to mitigate the impact of poverty. There's another conference going on somewhere that's gonna cure poverty. Um, I wasn't invited either. Uh, I think they're only meeting for 45 minutes anyway. So the question for those of us in the education movement are what can we do, what tools can we try to mobilize to face the reality that poverty is substantial and is not going away in the next decade. Early childhood, but also the things that community schools do. I mean, to, to just put it succinctly. Right? It's the wraparound services, whether they're co-located in the school or not. It's that kind of bureaucratic reinvention. It's parental and family engagement in various ways that will support 
the academic success of their kids, but will also democratize the way in which school policy is made, and so that there's buy-in from the community to support this education enterprise for each and every child. Um, so the lesson that we are offering is, if you want to improve outcomes for our kids, if you want to improve education for all kids, don't spend too much time wringing your hands about poverty. Instead, because it's there, and it shouldn't be used as an excuse, it's simply another set of problems that we have to do our best to tackle with what's available to us. We can't eliminate poverty, but we can mitigate some of its success, some of its effects, uh, if we do several things that are supported by research. Now, wait a minute. Okay, so this is a little backwards. I lost a slide somewhere. I had something brilliant to say kind of right in between here, but I guess it's going by too fast. Um, all right, well, here's what it said. I can't remember what it said. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, uh, but the fifth basket is, is, it's about accountability and governance. And here's the simple point. Um, we reiterate the data point. Uh, change here is so uh, infuriatingly complicated in part because the federalism of it is so complicated. Federal governments, state governments, county governments, municipal governments, separate school boards, 15,000 school districts. Uh, take something like the new tests for Common Core. Well, if I just talk about the 36 people who know that there will be new tests associated with the Common Core, 95% of them assume that this is a test that the federal government somehow created and is requiring that states adopt, which, if, which is not at true at all. Which is not true at all. Uh, but if you're upset about them, you don't know who to blame. You don't know who's responsible. If something good happens, you don't know who to praise. If something bad happens, you don't know who to blame. But the chief recommendation is that if we have to, if, that we have to put all three of these pieces, data, analysis, intervention, followed by collecting more data, doing more analysis, intervening again, and continuing that process so that we have learning that takes place over time, not just in our kids, but in the way we work on systemic issues. The problem, among several others, is that most districts and many states lack the capacity to really do this. So even if they have the data to indicate that this school or this district is having trouble, most states are really quite weak at figuring out how to deploy resources and wisdom to help that district figure out what to do. So when we talk about governance and accountability, along with that comes this issue of capacity to do continuous learning. So now let me shift to where we go from here. So I'd like to stipulate that the recommendations of the commission are fabulous. They're, they are, I mean, they're research-based, they're Their fabulosity is, be, is, is beyond description. Trust me on that, okay? Here's what we think we have done. We think what we have done is said that after a nation at risk in 1983, the country went through 30 years of focusing on standards-based, largely test-driven school reform strategies with a little bit of quasi-market stuff, choice, charters, et cetera, thrown in. And there's been some progress. But particularly from an equity standpoint, 
not nearly enough progress. No Child Left Behind, or Nickleby as I call it, was in many respects a good step forward because at least we started getting more data about where the problems are, even if the consequences of inadequate performance were totally screwed up. But at least we got more of a handle on what is the nature of the problem and where is the problem. What we wanted to come up with with these five baskets of recommendations is a new pole star to substitute for this 30 years of test-driven, standards-based accountability and improvement. A new pole star, which in shorthand we can think of as each and every child, doing what's needed for each and every child to have an effective instructional strategy and genuine opportunity, each and every child. Okay, so if that's the pole star, and we have a battle plan, a comprehensive battle plan, all five bas baskets, zillions of recommendations about how to go after that pole star. All that's missing is the army and the ammunition. And the question is, if people review these ideas, which are completely aligned with the equity document that you're sitting on, if people agree that, yeah, that's the direction we want to head in, right, right, right over that way, my work is aligned with that. I can see my work within this comprehensive strategy. I want to be part of this army. If we can get people moving in this general direction over the next 10 years towards that pole star, we believe we can make, the commission members believe we can make an enormous amount of progress. But that requires movement building like this. It requires movement building. So here's what we're trying to do. You can think of this as sort of three lines of business to pursue this each and every child effort. Um, obviously, business number one is trying to identify people who want to join this army, who will agree that that's the right pole star. But business number two, the central issue here, is creating hubs of interested people connected in the real world and in cyberspace with shared concerns around substantive issues of various sorts, learning from each other, deciding what they think is right, understanding what the most recent experiences and research teach us, and also a network of geographically identified hubs so that we have people in particular jurisdictions, maybe it's a district, maybe it's part of a district, maybe it's a state, coming together and trying to decide what is our education change agenda for the next year, two years, three years? What might we be able to accomplish in California or in Mississippi given the, the politics, budget issues, the potential coalition partners, the rest of the environment. We don't have enough of these kind of hubs around the country. Obviously there's some, but there aren't nearly enough to build a movement. So we have to seed additional hubs that are geographically based and that are issue based. Community schools is an interesting case, and Marty, I really want to pursue this with you and your staff. In a sense, the community school's idea and the way the commission thought of it as part of the alleviation of poverty basket is an idea. And increasing the number of people who are thinking about how to do it and trying to do it the right way is certainly part of it. But there's also a sense in which one could think of community schools as a school district in and of itself. It's kind of geographical, it's kind of an idea. It sits it's an interesting example, and I think it's an example of what the movement as a whole needs to look like. So let me close. The central idea is each and every child. The way we thought about approaching equity and excellence and what are the policy prescriptions uh, I, I offered a triangle. 
Uh, and on this triangle, if you can imagine that one vertex stands for politics, another stands for intuition, and a third stands for evidence or science. Each of those three, politics, intuition, evidence, is a way of making policy decisions. So if you pick a point in the middle of the triangle somewhere, some, somewhere in the interior, that could, you could think of that as representing how much weight a decision maker gives each of those different ways of thinking about policy change. Are you doing it just based on the politics of it? Are you doing it based on some gut instinct about what you think will be good for kids? Are you doing it because there's research that demonstrates that this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Just as I was arguing that in school finance we should stop spending money on things that don't work, that is to say, we should spend more of our time closer to the evident vertex of that triangle. So too, when we move forward in every issue going forward, when you move forward to think about what's the most effective way to engage parents, or what's the best way to design an early childhood program, check yourself and ask, do I have evidence, or is this just my intuition? Or is this just the popular way of going about it? And the less clear you are about the firm evidentiary basis for what you're doing, then the more humble you should be in prescribing it for the children who are most in need of the right answers. So that's one point. My second closing point is that We have so many great ideas. We have so much terrific work that's going on around the country. Why is it that the pace of progress seems so slow for the nation as a whole? Why is it that the pace of progress seems so slow? Well, of course, there are a bazillion answers to that. But you should pick your top three as you think about your work going forward. Is the problem that your work is racialized and that triggers a lot of opposition? Is your problem that there's bureaucratic opposition to the efforts that you're making to combine services and deliver them in a new way? Is the problem that the leadership in your community is inadequate to the difficulty of the task? Why is it that it is taking so long to do what we know so clearly must be done? It's not because everybody else is stupid. It's not only because everybody else is stupid. My takeaway lesson from it is that we need to be smarter about our strategy for making progress. The great work we're doing, we're still not doing it exactly the right way. Otherwise, there would be a wildfire across the country, excellence for all. And the last thing I want to say is that uh, you know there is no more important civil rights or social justice issue for the years ahead than this one. Um, and I can tell you that having worked in, I guess, five or six presidential campaigns, in every one of those campaigns, I've tried to get the candidate to embrace education as a central part of the strategy for campaigning. And I have failed every time. In fact, the only candidate uh, that I can recall who really did that in a serious way was George W. Bush, uh, not my former student. Did I mention what a bad grade he got? No, <laughs> right. 
So the biggest challenge from my point of view, uh, I, I heard last night that, that Marty is fond of using a phrase uh, that we need to have yes in our hearts, working as a coalition. Well, with thanks to Marty, I would adapt it and say that the key to our progress is to see to it that Americans across the country have each and every child in their hearts. And there will be different messages for different audiences. If I'm at the Chamber of Commerce, I may talk about competitiveness and career. If I'm with my people, whoever they are, I'm more likely to strike a, a moral or ethical tone. I'm more likely to talk about the fairness and the fairness that we need in America. There are many arguments, many methods, many phrases, many different language for different audiences. But the bottom rock principle, I believe, is that we must have each and every child in our hearts. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. And congratulations on all of your work. Thank you, Chris. Indeed, uh, with the yes goes, every child deserves every chance, um, which is what we are about as a coalition and trying to create. So we are part of this broader equity movement and we really want to deepen our relationships. And we've always seen community schools as connected to everyone. We are part of a wider movement of people that is really trying to bring equity and better opportunity and better results to every child. So we're a little bit late. I want to say a couple of things uh, and then we'll go. Uh, on a point of personal privilege, while all of you are here, the Institute for Educational Leadership, which I'm also privileged to lead, is 50 years old this year. Um, IEL, thank you. Uh, IEL was formed in the cauldron of the Civil Rights Movement at the beginning of the Economic Opportunity Act and the War and Poverty in the early stages of the Elementary and Secondary Act. And so helping support this coalition is a part of the mission that put us on the map and brought us into being these 50 years ago. So it's a, it's a great honor to be able to continue to do that. So thank you all. It's a great start. There's so much energy. Thanks so much.